Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're getting ready for the season at a big shoot in Gloucestershire. We're off to one of Britain's most popular clay competitions, the Beretta World. Tiger Pistols, we look at the perfect firearm for a close encounter with a big cat. First, releasing foxes into the countryside. We find out what's really going on. This footage proves that animal welfare groups are releasing unfit and orphaned foxes into the wild. This pen used by the Fox Project in Kent is in private woodland near Maidstone. The footage was passed on to us by a concerned party who came across the setup when he went looking for his dog. The young foxes are being fed on dog food and even though they look healthy, it is very unlikely they will survive. Firstly, because they won't have learnt how to hunt and find food, unless of course they can deal with a tin opener, and secondly, because someone will shoot them. Because the foxes are being released within yards of free-range chickens and ducks. Just minutes before we arrived at one house which backs onto the wood with a pen, a chicken was rescued from the jaws of a fox. Two nasty puncture wounds show this bold daytime Charlie so very nearly got an easy lunch. Um, chased after it and, uh, and it actually dropped the chicken which came running back to the other chicken but but it's, um, I don't know whether it's going to survive or not. It's been badly bitten, obviously, where it was grabbed and taken, but, uh, but we, we shall see whether it survives or not. Smallholder Phil Chandler thinks the foxes in the area are more numerous, getting bolder and looking for easy prey as they just don't know how to hunt. They seem to be taking the easy option, which obviously is people's chicken. People try and keep them more naturally, free range and that sort of thing, and, uh, and they're not able to do it with the amount of foxes we've got around here. And his neighbours have been having problems too. Even yesterday while she was sitting out watching um, her wildfowl, she was putting some of them back and turned her back and there was a fox with one of the others in its mouth. Just jumped over the fence into the run, taken the duck and, and gone. The Fox Project gives veterinary help to foxes that have been hit by cars or found as cubs by concerned members of the public or trapped and they have mange. The Fox Project gives them names. It treats them and it releases them on private land all over the southeast of England. Here are some extracts from its Facebook page. Forest, a dog fox had to have a rear leg amputated, was re released on his home territory. Rowan, had to have her rear leg amputated following a road accident, was re released. A mangy vixen named Trisha was cage trapped. A second vixen, possibly suffering from uremia, was received from RSPCA. The Fox Project did not want to talk about this case. Trevor Williams, who runs this, sent us this statement. In choosing release sites, we rely on the advice and knowledge of the person offering the facility, who are universally rural householders, farmers and smallholders. Living where they do, I am sure they would share our concerns that the potential for conflict with neighbouring interests is avoided. Trevor adds that if he agrees there is conflict with a local chicken farmer, the pen will not be used for release. Now that's a cut down version of the statement, we put the full version on our website. We asked the RSPCA if they would like to be interviewed, they wussed out as well, but they sent us this statement. Our policy regarding foxes is that we release them as near as possible to where they were found. If it's on private land, this has to be done on approved sites with landowners permission. They are put into release pens for two to three weeks to get them used to the wild. When staff are looking for release sites, they will try and avoid places near to concerns such as this one. You coming over, little one? Regular contributor and fox expert for Sporting Shooter magazine, Roy Lupton was astounded when he saw the footage. For the last few years, um, the, the fox charities and the wildlife uh, rehab centres, etc., have been. Uh, calling us or calling the shooting fraternity should I say liars and saying that uh, this sort of thing doesn't go on they don't throw foxes out of the back of vans and uh, throw them into places where they uh, could come into harm's way and uh, now we've got proof that this sort of thing is going on I mean okay we haven't got the proof that uh, the foxes have just been released straight out of the back of the vans into fields but what they're doing with uh, young orphan fox cubs is, is just as bad, if not worse. In the past, he's been involved with wildlife introduction programmes. He knows what can go wrong if the groundwork isn't done. One notable one was uh, a barn owl release project, and the subsequent research proved that that was flawed. Uh, because we hadn't done a suitable assessment of the habitats that these birds were being released into and there wasn't the available quarry for them and that 
it, it actually turned out that if a, if there was a, an available territory that was suitable for these birds, then it was already occupied by a pair of barn owls. And we can draw similes here because the foxes are being released into territories where we're already at saturation point with the amount of foxes. And these foxes are being released into an area that's not been vetted. The people around here have not been asked. There's been no surveys done on whether people have got free-range chickens or whether they've got stock that the foxes will interfere with. And so the, the, the charity's ethos is obviously very flawed. We are often accused of demonising foxes. Not a bit of it. Roy has a healthy respect for this cunning predator. I do like foxes. I think foxes are, are fantastic animals. I've got a, a great deal of respect for them. The problem is, when these animals have been interfered with by people, you are completely altering the mindset of that animal. You are um, imprinting them to people, you're habituating them to humans, and then to expect them to live as a wild animal and fully functioning wild animal is plain stupid. Most animal welfare organisations deny they release urban foxes into the wild, even offering cash rewards if evidence of that is forthcoming. As much as we'd like the cash, we cannot tell if these youngsters are city folk or not. What we do know is that releasing foxes in the countryside is nuts. Releasing them next to a free-range chicken run is dangerously idiotic, and feeding them on dog food before you release them is plain cruel. One place you don't want foxes is in amongst the pheasants and partridges. We're off to see a Gloucestershire gamekeeper who says this is his busiest time of year. Gamekeepers live in beautiful cottages rent-free and enjoy holidays that a primary teacher would envy. Of course I'm joking. These lads and lasses work hard all year round and this year in particular have had to cope with some extremely odd weather during our spring and early summer. We join Kevin on his ground in Gloucestershire as he sorts out his young pheasants and partridges. The work is heavy, especially if you're rearing as well as managing your birds. He needs tons of food, heating and water to keep his investment healthy. You've got to keep a very close eye on them. You know, the last three weeks, three to four weeks have been probably the, one of the hardest rearing seasons in this area. Um, the temperature has been fluctuating 10 degrees up and down you know from morning to night um, heavy thunderstorms when it's rained it's poured down but we're very lucky that it's Cotswold brush so it dries within 48 hours you know it'll, it'll dry very very quickly but it's just monitoring the birds constantly keeping them on fresh ground um, and giving them lots and lots of space but there is good news for this head keeper he's got extra mechanical help The poults are only days away from release. They need as comfortable a start as possible in the wild. That means delivering bales of straw around the release pens. Just putting a few shelters in for when we release the partridges in August. They're never in the pens very long. They're only in the pens 24 hours. But you know they, they, they've just got a little bit of shelter. Um, they're all reared on the rearing field to 14 weeks yep. and we release them at 14 weeks um, and within a week the pen's taken down so you wouldn't know there's a release site you're, um, you know the old-fashioned way of shooting was topping up but well, that's a thing of the past now right. all the birds are released um, by middle of August yep. and then it's up to us to look after them, manage them and hopefully guide them over the guns come, come, come shoot days over that way yeah over the valley just tell, tell me what topping up was um years ago in, in you know people used to release partridges and top up so during the season they would top partridge up yeah uh, and then oh, and, yeah. and continue shooting but now that practice is is banned which is good yeah um, for the industry so now you know you everything's released before first of september yeah um hours are released sort of you know six weeks before the first shoot day yes and then we send around management holding them on the ground and keeping them secure. He doesn't want to use heavy machinery on this crop, which is part of his conservation effort, so his new JCB is just the ticket. You've been nothing but impressed. You know, you know, I'm not just saying that because we've got one and you're filming, filming us today. You know, that's got nothing to do with it. You know, it's, we, we've still got quad bikes, but we're, we're going over onto the JCB vehicles um, because, you know, when the lads leave the food store, they've got their food 
on the back for each pen. So we find the JCB vehicles are so much safer for, for everybody in the working environment. The new JCB is an 800D, which goes alongside the 1000D the estate already owns and uses constantly. So how did it perform? It's a full package. Um, you know, it's an English company. Um, if it breaks down, it's that day or the next day for the part from the factory. Um, the backup service is unbelievable. We cannot afford a vehicle. We haven't got two brand new vehicles sat in a shed, so if one breaks down, we can jump on another one. That vehicle has to work seven days a week, you know, and work all the time. Kevin and his crew still have months of work leading up to the beginning of the season. Thankfully, his days are pretty much all sold. All he has to do now is make sure his birds are still here, dry, healthy, uneaten and flying like missiles come the autumn. Now from pheasants to clays, I went along to the Beretta World Clay Competition in Hampshire. I'm at the biggest Beretta event in the world. Held over three days in June, the Beretta World brings in enthusiasts for this gunmaker from all over the country. Usually a trout fishery for one day a year, Meon Springs becomes a shooting ground and auditorium and host to the competition that offers more than £35,000 worth of prizes. We actually could have taken another 30 or 40 people over the weekend, but you know, I, I don't think there's any shoot that had more entries, possibly the Essex Masters this year, but uh, you know, nearly a thousand shooters in what is supposed to be a recession. It's great for shooting, it's great for us. Yeah. Sponsors play an important part in the day, as well as the King's Ginger, which used the Beretta World to launch its new Beretta Blitz drink, that's the King's Ginger with bitter lemon over ice, Breitling is backing shooting, donating a Breitling chronomat worth £6,400 to go to the winner. And Ely Hawk gave more than 50,000 cartridges in prizes. You have to use a Beretta for the Beretta world, but there's one gun none of them Thank will be using. That's because it's so new. There are only two Beretta A400s in the country, and they are both here. The gun pod is a new concept, it records the amount of shots that the gun has fired, uh, the temperature outside, uh, the recoil from the, or the uh, velocity from the, from the shells that are being used. Why would I want to know recoil and temperature and things like that? Well I think for clay shooters they're, um, you know, they're very passionate with regards to their sport so uh, you know, any, any feature and it's, it's, it's a new idea and I think it's something that will, will, will be very well received. You will be able to see the new A400 at the CLA Game Fair on the 22nd to the 24th of July 2011 at Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. It will be on GMK's stand P1044 at the top of Gunmakers Row. Back to the shoot and a lot of what makes the Beretta into such a great day out is in the course design. It's a kind of magic, as Peter Corney of Travelling Clays explains. It's all angles. Angles and speed, not necessarily distance. You can put a target on that's going to make it look like it's doing something it's not actually doing. An optical illusion, if you like. Sometimes we put targets in that will actually make them distract them from the second target. The first one. Of course, this means having reliable traps. It's a proving ground for our product. Um, I'm all in favour of proving the port back to be the number one sporting machine. Uh, we've already proven to be the best Olympic discipline. That's why we're doing 212 Olympics um, in London. And I'm determined to put the port back as number one for the sporting. And this is a good showground. What about the competition itself? The friendly atmosphere of Meon Springs provides the perfect place to shoot and to watch the shooting. The Wimbledon men's final is taking place today and the spectators' heads here are doing the same as the spectators' heads there, backwards and forwards, watching the shots. From nearly a thousand shooters over three days, the shoot-off is between just six of them. Multiple world champion Ben Hustthwaite is favourite for the prize, but a rumour is circulating that he's unwell. Will Jason Alloway be in with a chance to win his first Beretta World? Jason shoots for Derbyshire, but he's better known as a match carp angler and runs a fishery in Nottinghamshire. Maybe that's why he feels so relaxed and confident at Meon Springs. Two guns shoot it off for third place, with Chris Brumfield taking it. 
After an incredible day's competition in glorious surroundings, the crowd gather to see the prize giving. There are awards for various classes of shooter, ladies, veterans and juniors. Field Sports Channel regular Amber Hill is a winner. Jason Alloway receives the top prize, an incredible trophy and a magnificent timepiece. He's a very happy man. It's one of the events that you look forward to every year. Uh, the Beretta, it's one of the biggest events in the calendar. I think um, the gentleman said it was a record entry this year, 940 odd entrants, so that speaks for itself. Um, and it, I mean, what, could, what more could you ask a day like today? Shooting plays and, and then actually winning, obviously, just uh, finished it off. Olympic gold medal winner Richard Folds comes eighth. That doesn't stop his son, young Charlie Folds, climbing up onto the podium. Get used to it, kiddo. From Hampshire to the Raj. Planning to travel anywhere by elephant? Top Gun collector John Ormiston has just the thing for your howder. Some people, they say, are worth their salt. Some know their onions. A few have lost their marbles. This guy lives and breathes guns. People like to have a pistol in case the tiger attacked the elephant and tried to jump on the back of the elephant. And so various types of howdah pistol were developed, um, most of which, the early ones, were all double-barreled. Um, and this is an example by Wesley Richards. It's actually quite a rare one because it's a pin fire which came before centre fire. So it had pins sticking up off the cartridges. So it was from about 1856 to 1860. It's about 20 bore. Um, so it would give something a pretty good thwack at um, close range. Would, and would, you, would you have used a solid slug in that? Yeah, solid slug. Um, and uh, you'd have a lanyard on it, so if you dropped it, uh, it you didn't lose it. As time went by and the uh, centre fire cartridges came in, uh, you could actually use a smaller calibre, and this is a, a Lancaster um, 476 calibre. And Lancaster developed um, a method of having one trigger and also one firing pin, but it would go around several barrels. So this has a single trigger, it's got four barrels, and every time you pull the trigger, the hammer fires a different barrel, so you could go bang, 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 before you needed to reload. And then you just did that, it threw out the cartridges, and you put four more in, and you were ready again. But in um, in 1885, if you were somewhere in the, near the Khyber Pass with um, defending yourself, that could come in quite handy. Now, that's not the only pistol. I mean, there was, a, there was a, a tradition of sporting pistols in this country at the same time, wasn't there? And you've got a ratting pistol. There. Yeah, well, this is one made by Webley, probably in the 1930s or 1940s, a single barrel pistol. Um, how do you open it? Here we go. And this is actually a 9mm, so a little bit smaller than 410. That's a garden gun. Size. And so a garden gun for shooting birds in fruit trees or um, shooting rats and uh, still quite effective. You imagine uh, the action that gun has seen in barns and... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> This one actually is in quite good condition. A lot of them are often, as you say, have been used a lot and it even has its original... Uh, uh, leather holster, which is quite unusual. Now, people are always worried about the legality of these things. Um, these are all working firearms. Yeah. They haven't been covered by the pistol ban, have they? Yeah. Been? Well, basically, um, there is um, there is a provision in the Act that allows, if the pistol is made pre-1916 and it's in a non-readily available calibre and if one's local chief constable is willing to regard one as a collector, so those are three provisions that have to be met, then he can allow you to have that pistol on a, on a firearm certificate, but not for use. So, so it's for like collector's pistols, pre-1916 manufacture and in a not readily available calibre. So for instance, something like a Luger in 9mm, even if it was pre-1916, is not allowed because the 9mm cartridge is considered to be still readily available. But that's 9mm. This is 9mm, but it's for shot. 
so it's a far less lethal thing and it's actually a, um, a shotgun rather than a uh, and it wouldn't uh, this also is nine millimeter but it's rim fire it's, it wouldn't fire the nine millimeter cartridge so it's just like a little nine millimeter rim fire shotgun cartridge and if you go to an auction you buy some of these old cartridges are you allowed to use these guns no no if you did do that uh, you would be contravening the uh, so if the local chief constable sees a lot of dead tigers lying around, he's going to come knocking on your door? Yeah, well, he and the World Wildlife Fund probably as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's how you can win a Browning 525 shotgun and how you can help us, Field Sports Channel, win £15,000. In August 2011, to get you ready for the shooting season ahead, our friends at the Oxford Gun Company are giving away a Browning 525 shotgun for the top score on its Browning Rabbit Mania stand. The winner of highest score of the week will also win 250 Winchester cartridges. Entries are £12 per round, shoot as many times as you like. It must be shot using a Browning, Maruku or Winchester shotgun. Loan guns are available. Visit www.oxfordguncompany.co.uk for more details. As for helping us, YouTube has selected us, Field Sports Channel, as one of the entrants for its YouTube Next Up competition. And we need your votes by the 9th of July 2011. Simply go to www.youtube.com slash nextup where you will see videos sent in by entrants from all over Europe. Please watch them and please vote, but please make sure you look for our video. The picture on it shows two blokes in front of a green hedge. Click to watch it, click on the thumbs up next to it. We're the only hunting, shooting, fishing channel in the competition. Not only do you do us a favour, you show YouTube just how enthusiastic field sportsy people are about their sport. Well, we're back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain coming to you this week inexplicably from Sweden. Reasons that will become clear another week. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button that's about there on the screen. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, scroll down to the bottom, pop your email address into the constant contact form. Or click to like us on Facebook, same place, or follow us on Twitter. And we'll send you details of our lovely programme every week.